This program on school's history project concentrates on medicine through time and the American West, two of the most popular courses of the GCSE school's history project. The two other programs on history are modern world history and modern British history. The best way to study with bite size is to tackle one topic at a time, working through the video in bite-sized chunks. Each program is full of useful information and sample questions for you to try. And there's more in the GCSE Bite Size books and on the GCSE Bite Size website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash revision. Throughout the program, there'll be sample questions for you to try your hand at, with advice on how to answer them. This program concentrates on Medicine Through Time, which is one of the studies in development, and the American West, an optional study in depth. Medicine Through Time is a study in development. That means you have to know about the history of medicine from the Stone Age to the present. The only way of handling such a huge span of time is to look for patterns and issues running through your study. For example, what can you learn from the story of medicine about this period? What did people believe about illness and cures? Was it a time of change or continuity? What factors were helping or stopping progress? These are the kinds of issues you will be asked about in your exam. In this program, we've divided the subject into two sections. In the first section, we look at the history of medicine period by period, from prehistoric times up to the 20th century. In the second section, we look at some long-term themes that run through the history of medicine, such as women in medicine and surgery. So, let's get started. The first period in the history of medicine that we're going to look at is prehistoric and Egyptian medicine. There are real problems in finding out about the prehistoric period, with no written evidence available. Evidence is limited to things like cave paintings, artifacts and skeletal remains from graves. It's also possible to study more recent peoples with comparable lifestyles, such as 19th century Australian Aborigines. Prehistoric people were hunter-gatherers who lived in small groups and kept on the move. There were no settled communities and few public health and hygiene problems. There was a powerful belief in spirits to explain the many things, including illness, which they couldn't explain otherwise. Prehistoric peoples had simple cures for obvious ailments. This included the medicinal use of plants and setting broken limbs in clay. They had little or no knowledge of how the body works. Disease and any illness which had no obvious cause was blamed on evil spirits. Medicine men were thought to wield power over these spirits with the ability to call them up or drive them out. Skulls found with holes in them indicate that trepanning was used, perhaps in an effort to drive out evil spirits. The ancient Egyptian civilization lasted roughly from 3000 BC to around 500 BC. Look at the following clip about ancient Egyptian medicine. Look for big differences, as well as some similarities with prehistoric people. Note down some key points about Egyptian medical practices. Well, thanks to their passion for building and painting elaborate tombs and temples, and their early invention of writing, we've got more continuous evidence about them than we have about any other ancient civilization. We know they believed in an afterlife. They thought that a dead person's spirit could be reunited with the body as long as the body survived. So they developed the idea of preserving the body by embalming it, using certain spices to keep it from decay. This didn't work for the most perishable parts like the liver, so they cut them out and preserved them separately in special jars. Some people think this experience helped them learn about the way the body worked. Certainly, some medical writings suggest that 4,000 years ago, Egyptian doctors had worked out that the heart, liver, and lungs were connected. 
46 channels go from the heart to every limb. If a doctor, priest or magician places his fingers on the back of the head or hands, then he hears the heart. There are four vessels to the liver, there are four vessels to the lungs. Flow away, cold, son of the cold, who shatters the skull so that sickness overtakes the followers of Ray who appeal to Thoth in prayer. Behold, I have used your medicine against you. Milk of a woman who has given birth to a son and fragrant gum will get rid of you. Above all, just about everyone carried amulets or charms to protect against illness. Here are the main points you need to remember. Egyptian doctors examined patients and simple surgery was performed. The advance of writing meant that expertise on symptoms, diseases and recipes for cures was written down and could be built on over time. Doctors were trained in the art and rules of medicine. Natural cures, like the use of willow as an antiseptic, were used alongside prayers, spells and charms to ward off illness. Religious rules encouraged cleanliness. Egyptians were required to wash regularly and change their clothes. Mummification involved taking out internal organs. This helped increase their knowledge of anatomy, although religious rules forbade dissection. They knew that the body contained channels like those of a river. It was thought that blockages in them caused diseases. A number of new factors in Egyptian civilization made medical advances possible. The fertility of the Nile Valley meant that not everyone needed to till the soil. An agricultural surplus meant that people were free to settle in towns. This in turn led to the creation of the first specialists, craftspeople, priests and doctors. Larger numbers of people living close together brought public health and hygiene problems and the need for strong government, the all-powerful pharaohs. Finally, the development of writing made it possible to record and pass on medical knowledge. That's the end of the section on prehistoric and Egyptian medicine. Now we move on to Greek and Roman medicine. The city-states of ancient Greece flourished between 600 and 300 BC. The Greeks traded across the Mediterranean and learned from other cultures, especially the Egyptians. Their culture was rich enough for some people to have leisure for scientific inquiry. Though they believed in many gods, they were interested in explaining the world around them and looked for natural explanations, not just divine ones. Watch the next clip and jot down a few notes about Greek medical beliefs and practices. This is a reconstruction of a building on the Greek island of Kos. It was the nearest thing the Greeks had to a hospital, but it was actually a temple to the god Asclepius, the god of healing. This is a description from a carved stone tablet found in a temple. A man had an abscess in his stomach. He came to the temple and he fell asleep. He dreamed that the god Asclepius ordered servants to grip him tightly. Asclepius cut his belly open and removed the abscess, then stitched him up. He was cured, but the floor around was covered in blood. These pictures of gods such as Asclepius survived because so many of them were made. But they don't tell us the full story about the Greeks. People had many different beliefs about illness. Historians say medicine was almost like a marketplace, with different healers offering different cures. Physicians, exorcists, bone setters, surgeons, herbalists. Doctors disagreed amongst themselves. The choice of which cure to try was left to the individual patient. Patients tried anything and everything and often religious healing was only used in the worst cases. Here are some of the things you should have noticed. 
The Greeks built healing centres called Asclepia from Asclepios, god of healing, where sick people went to find cures through worship in the comfort of a healthy lifestyle. They believed that the god, a snake entwined around his staff and with his daughters Panacea and Hygieia, would visit them during the night and cure them. A number of important medical books were written by the doctor Hippocrates of Kos and his followers. While watching the next clip, make notes about what seems to you to be important about these works. These doctors discussed how illness was caused and how it could be cured. They observed the patients carefully to try and find out what caused disease. This is one case they wrote about. It was a case of epilepsy. The boy had these symptoms. In winter he was sitting by the fire in the bathhouse, being rubbed with oil. Suddenly he had a fit. When the fit stopped he looked about. He was confused and could hardly speak. We took him to the temple. They called it the sacred disease and said we were to wait. They said they wanted to see him when the fit took hold. When it came, it was like usual. He was foaming at the mouth and kicking with his legs. Do you remember? Th they said that Ares was visiting the child. Ares the god. You hear that, Simeus? How can they call themselves religious men when they believe the gods would do this to a child? And if he'd screamed out in his fit, they would have said, it is the god Poseidon, because he's neighing like a horse, and Poseidon rides a horse. And if he passed small turds, they would have said, it's Apollo. For the god Apollo loves birds, and these are like bird droppings. It's nonsense. For the Hippocratic doctors, epilepsy, like any other disease, had natural, not supernatural, causes. One of them wrote, It's only because this disease is so different from other diseases that people think it's caused by the gods. People view these fits in ignorance and fear. But this disease is a natural disease, and those that call it sacred are witch doctors, faith healers, and quacks. From their observations, Hippocratic doctors came to conclusions about the human body. They said that a healthy body is a body in balance, and that when the body was out of balance, it was sick. Too much hot or too much cold, too much wet or too much dry could cause sickness. They believed epilepsy was caused by too much cold, wet phlegm, blocking the air from moving around the body. It shuts off the supply of air to the brain and to the blood. The numbness that you feel when you've been seated too long, it's the same effect. But in this case, it causes a fit. He loses his voice and he loses his wits. We are all unstable creatures. We are all liable to get ill. And a disorder this hard to diagnose is harder yet to cure. Here are the main points you should have picked out about the Hippocratic doctors. Instead of blaming gods or spirits, they look for natural causes, even for apparently religious conditions like epilepsy. They practice clinical observation, noting all symptoms and carefully recording what they saw. Only then would they follow with a diagnosis of the illness, describe what would happen and perhaps treat it. This is still the core of modern methods of medical treatment. Hippocratic doctors had to treat their patients with respect, not take advantage of them. The origin of the Hippocratic Oath or doctor's code of conduct right up to the present. Greek thinkers emphasized the idea of balance in all things. In medicine, this included a balanced lifestyle, eating in moderation, taking some exercise, sleeping regularly and keeping clean. A person's health was believed to be affected by the proportions of four humors inside each human being, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm and blood. It was thought that an imbalance in any of these caused illness. One of the ways of restoring the balance doctors came up with was bloodletting. So, to sum up, the Greeks made an important contribution to the history of medicine. 
the theory of the four humours survived for 2,000 years, only being finally discarded during the 18th century. Despite the fact that few new treatments were discovered, the Greeks pioneered a scientific rather than spiritual approach to medicine. Now for some practice. Here's a typical exam question about Greek medicine. The body has blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. These make up the parts of the body and through them we feel illness or enjoy health. This is a quote from a book written by Hippocratic doctors in about 400 BC. In what ways did Hippocratic ideas about causes and cures of illness mark a turning point in the history of medicine? In an exam, this question would carry six marks. How would you answer it? Stop the tape now and note down the main points of your answer. Let's look at some summary answers. Two different attempts at answering the question. The first attempt could expect average marks and the second higher ones. The Hippocratic idea was that the body was made up of four humours and you became ill when these were out of balance. It was a turning point because it was used by doctors for many centuries afterwards. Galen wrote about it and medieval doctors were taught it. Cures were based on the theory. For example, people were bled to remove excess blood right up to the 17th century. This student has explained the theory and described correctly how it was part of medical practice for the next 2,000 years. However, it only deals with what came after. It doesn't describe how the Hippocratic doctors broke with what people believed before. This student would probably be heading for a C grade. Before the Greeks, people had believed that most diseases were caused by spirits, so the cure was through prayer or offerings to the gods. The four humours theory was a turning point because it put illness down to causes inside the patient, to be cured by treating the body of the patient. Although the theory of the four humours is wrong, it was believed for many centuries afterwards. It was the first attempt to explain illness by natural causes. This student has really set the theory of four humours in the history of medicine. What is important is not so much that it was commonly believed for the next 2,000 years, although the answer does mention that, but that it broke away from spiritual explanations of disease to natural and or scientific explanations. This is, of course, the approach we have today. This student could probably look forward to an A grade. Now for the Romans, who learnt a lot of what they knew about medicine from the Greeks, but took it further. The great period of Roman history lasted from about 270 BC to 476 AD. The Romans built up a huge empire, stretching from northern England to the Middle East, including the Greek world. They founded towns and cities all over their empire. Rome was the largest city in the world. They believed in many gods, but the empire eventually became Christian. The Romans were practical, and their approach to medicine was based on observation and common sense. They were city dwellers, and understood the importance of public health to city life. For example, they knew that a clean water supply was necessary for a healthy town life. They were great engineers, and built aqueducts, pipes and fountains to lead water from the mountain springs into the cities. Public baths were used for social relaxation as well as to keep clean. They even built public toilets flushed by running water. The Romans didn't know about germs, but they could see that people living near stagnant water or in unhygienic conditions were unhealthy, so they avoided them. They thought disease was transmitted by bad air. This is in fact incorrect, but it was a theory which lasted until well into the 19th century and led to sensible practical solutions. The Romans built hospitals and kept patients in separate wards to prevent cross-infection. The most influential Roman doctor was Galen, born in 129 AD. As you watch the clip, make notes about what might have made him so important. Galen was born 500 years after the Hippocratic doctors in what's now Turkey. He spoke Greek, but for 40 years he practiced in Rome in Italy where Greek doctors were considered to be the best. He treated the emperor successfully and became Rome's leading doctor. We still have his autobiography, which he wrote because, he said, 
so many inferior doctors were passing off his work as their own. Galen was a show-off, but he was also a brilliant doctor. This 16th century illustration shows him soon after his arrival in Rome, performing a public dissection on a live pig. His aim was to show the doctors of Rome how far his studies had advanced. Do you know they still believe the heart controls what we do? It's the brain controls what we do, but only if you make the cut can you prove it. So, I had this pig strapped to the table. I sliced into its neck and found its nerves. It was squealing the whole time. I said, watch. When I cut this nerve, it'll squeal. I make the cut. Again, when I cut this nerve, again, it'll squeal. But when I cut this nerve, the pig will no longer be able to squeal. And I cut, and the pig's completely silent, proving the brain, not the heart, controls speech. Everything they believed, in a moment. Galen's aim was to explain everything about the body, the purpose of each part of the body, what the heart, the brain and the liver do, and how they all work together. He turned medical thinking since Hippocrates into one system, a system which became very powerful and then influenced Western medical thought for the next 1400 years. But Galen had a problem that hindered his development as a doctor. He needed to study the body inside as well as out. In ancient Rome, cutting up dead bodies was simply not done. It wasn't forbidden, but few Greeks or Romans would have dreamed of interfering with a corpse. It was an example of religious beliefs holding back medical progress. You have to study human bones. I don't mean study in books. Even my books, which granted are by far the best. No, I'm talking about real bones. Skeletons. Seeing them with your own eyes. Touching them. Understanding how they move, how they fit together. It's difficult. But it's not impossible. I was doctor to the gladiator school for a while. That was good. All those fit and well-muscled men slicing into each other. I got to see inside some very interesting wounds. Galen also used to search for big family tombs with the marble doors broken so that he could get inside. I'd spent hours lost in excitement, fixing myself on what I was seeing, determined to remember every bone, every joint. How I'd have wished to take one of those skeletons to have with me when I wrote, to make sure my account was perfect and free from mistakes. Though Galen claimed to have seen human corpses, the evidence suggests he never did an actual full dissection on a human being. Instead, he had to rely heavily on dissections of apes and other animals. And it meant, despite his brilliance, he did make mistakes. He wrote that the left kidney is lower than the right, correct for an ape, but not for a human. He described the womb, but in fact he was describing the womb of a dog. And because religious beliefs made dissections difficult, it was hard for anyone to challenge his work or to prove he was wrong. In his lifetime, Galen wrote over 250 books. And because he was writing at the centre of the powerful Roman Empire, his ideas spread. But today, only about half the writings have survived, and they are copies of copies of copies. Galen wrote Greek, but some of his books survive today only in translations, in Arabic, Hebrew or Latin. Here are some of the main points you should have noted down. Galen rejected superstition in favour of clinical observation and dissection. He brought together the medical tradition of the Greeks and the practical approach of the Romans. Galen's work was the basis of medical knowledge in Europe for the next 1400 years. You may well be asked to write about Galen in the exam. Here's an example of the kind of question you could be asked. Many of Galen's ideas were wrong. Does this mean that he is not important in the history of medicine? This question would probably carry eight marks. This style of question is like a coconut shy, inviting you to knock it down. It gives some information by saying that Galen made mistakes. It tells you what to write about, 
that is, how important Galen was. And finally, it asks you to comment on it. This kind of question is often used in an exam. Here's a tip. Never agree with the coconut shy statement. Don't be misled by the examiner. Is it true he made mistakes? Above all, why was he important? With eight marks at stake, you should probably write about three paragraphs. Here's another tip. Always make a plan for longer answers. Examiners want an organized answer, not just a jumble of points. Now it's over to you. Stop the tape now and make a plan for three paragraphs on the importance of Galen. Here are the main points you ought to make and a suggestion for a plan. The first paragraph should deal with who Galen was and what he did. He was a Greek doctor of the second century AD who worked in Rome and he was very popular in his day. He knew the importance of understanding the skeleton and the functions of parts of the body. The second paragraph should look at Galen's limitations. He had problems dissecting humans, so he used animals such as pigs and dogs. This led to some mistakes in his descriptions. Your third paragraph should deal with Galen's importance. Galen's writings were important for 1400 years. His books pulled together everything known from the Greek and Roman world. When Rome fell, some of Galen's books survived, so forming the basis of the education of doctors in the Middle Ages. He was the great authority, unquestioned, mistakes and all, until the 16th century. In my history mark, I got a D. I was really, really gutted. So, I decided to try and change that. I went to loads of revision classes and learnt to refer to the question. And in the end, I got an A. So rather than writing everything you know about the topic, answer the question. That's the end of the section on Greek and Roman medicine. Now, we move on to medieval medicine. The medieval period, or Middle Ages, lasted from the end of the Roman Empire until the beginning of the Renaissance. After Galen's death, the Roman Empire became less and less powerful. In 410 AD, Rome was sacked. The Romans no longer ruled Western Europe, and their civilization fell apart. This meant that medical study was badly affected. There were fewer libraries and schools. Transport was not safe, so scholars didn't travel. Fewer people had the money and time to study. A very important consequence was the separation of the Latin and Greek languages. The eastern and western halves of the Roman Empire gradually split apart. Greeks no longer understood Latin, and Romans no longer understood Greek. So many Greek medical ideas were not studied in the West. The Greek language, Galen's language, survived in the East. When the Arabs conquered the eastern part of the old Roman Empire, Arabic scholars discovered Greek books and translated them into Arabic. From 832 to 900 AD, hundreds of Greek writings on medicine and science were translated into Arabic. Western scholars wouldn't be able to read these books for another 200 years. The Middle Ages was a time of little change in medicine. Medical knowledge and treatment stayed at the same low level for nearly 1,000 years. A number of factors caused this. Knowledge of public health, the importance of clean water for instance, was lost after the fall of the Roman Empire. It was only in monasteries that good water systems survived. There was more instability in war. Libraries and universities collapsed and communications were poor, so it was much harder for doctors to learn or discuss ideas. During the Middle Ages, the church controlled all learning. This made progress in medical understanding difficult and slow. The church banned dissection, so knowledge of anatomy was poor. The first medical school set up in the Middle Ages was at Salerno in Italy, 
in about 900 AD. While you watch the next clip, make a note or two about the medieval attitude to medical knowledge. Teachers in the medieval universities would not have understood scientific ways of looking at medicine. They believed the best way to learn medicine was through reading ancient books and following them exactly. This is a typical lecture from a medieval professor, Bartholomew of Bruges, in about 1320, telling his students why they should study the ancient Greek writer Galen. Some students are lazy. They want to be educated without doing the work. Others are thick-headed. They rush through books and then forget them. Others have no enthusiasm. Galen has written the best book for these students. It is called The Art of Medicine. No other book has so much in it. No other book is so easy to remember. Most importantly, this book is written by Galen. And after Hippocrates, Galen is the best writer. This book is accurate and contains everything you want in medicine. It ought to be read first before all other books. No one ever suggested they should test Galen's ideas or try anything different to what Galen had said. Galen's work was considered to be better than the work of anyone alive. This was teaching in the medieval universities to look back almost without question, to the work of people who lived a thousand years before. During the Middle Ages, very different kinds of beliefs about health and medicine coexisted. On the one hand, magical, superstitious ideas were rife, including the belief in the efficacy of charms, spells, astrology, and pilgrimages to holy places in a search for cures. On the other hand, more natural, rational ideas, such as the four humors theory, persisted, Bleeding was a common treatment for all kinds of conditions, as was urine analysis, adopted from a misunderstanding of Hippocrates, and medicinal use of herbs and plants. There were some hospitals, usually in monasteries, but they offered food, a bed and prayers, rather than hope of a cure. That's the end of the section on medieval medicine. Now it's time to move on to the Renaissance. The Renaissance began in Europe around 1400, and its effects lasted well into the mid-18th century. As you watch this clip, jot down some notes about Renaissance attitudes to the wisdom of the past. The Renaissance was the rebirth of learning, an exciting time for intellectuals and artists. During the Renaissance, scholars became even more interested in the ancient world. And as they found out more, some scholars also began to ask questions and to think scientifically. At first, scholars only knew the ancient medical books as Latin translations. By 1500, as more people learned Greek, they could read Greek writers in their original language and it became fashionable to copy ancient Greek ways. Scholars saw how some ancients were interested in observation and in discussing ideas. They began to experiment and to use these ideas to develop medicine. They saw the difference between medieval art and Greek art. Greek and Roman statues seemed to be more realistic the body was shown with muscles and sinews. And in returning to these ancient traditions, looking for yourself, trusting your eyes, searching out what's real, some scholars found themselves in a dilemma, because by looking too hard, they found themselves disproving some of the things the ancients had believed to be true. Here are a few of the points you should have noticed. Now, for the first time, the church was unable to stifle criticism and in the Reformation lost its hold over many countries as well as universities and education. 
Among many new inventions at this time, printing began in Europe in 1454, making the transmission of new ideas easier and very much faster. Many more of Galen's writings were discovered and published, giving a different picture of him. They made clear how important he thought studying the skeleton and doing dissection was. Two key figures helped reinterpret classical views of medicine, Vesalius in the 16th century and William Harvey in the 17th century. While you watch the next clip, make notes on the contribution these two men made to medical history. Vesalius was born in 1514 in Belgium. His father was an apothecary. His grandfather was a doctor. Even as a boy, Vesalius used to trap small animals near his home so he could dissect them. By the age of 23, he was professor of anatomy at the University of Padua in Italy. At first, like every other student, he used Galen's work and followed it closely. Age 19, he even stole the skeleton of a hanged convict to keep in his room. But the more he saw, the more he came to realise that Galen had actually made mistakes. Stop it, you're annoying me. I know, and it's especially annoying because I'm right. You are not right. I don't know what it would take to convince you. If Galen said we had three arms, would you believe him? He says the human jawbone has two bones. Now, the monkey's jawbone, I grant you, has two bones, but the human jawbone has one. Look at it. Unlike Galen, Vesalius was able to carry out many, many dissections. He could do what Galen hadn't been able to. He could provide an accurate map of the inside of the entire human body. In 1543, still just 28 years old, Vesalius published his masterpiece, the Fabrica, a complete map of the human body. The bones, the muscles, the veins and arteries and nerves and organs illustrated by artists in the new realistic style. The book was printed and read widely. Within a year or two, every medical student in Western Europe would see, for the first time, the body as it actually was. It didn't explain what caused ill health, but it helped the next generation of scientists to make new discoveries about the body. William Harvey also studied medicine at the University of Padua, about 50 years after Vesalius. Although Vesalius had shown that Galen could be wrong, most doctors were still relying on Galen's ideas. His work was reprinted many times in this period and widely read in the universities. Harvey used scientific methods to prove things. Instead of just accepting Galen's work, he carried out many of his own experiments on animals. This was how Harvey discovered that Galen was wrong about how the blood moved around the body. He came up with a completely new discovery of the circulation of the blood. By careful measuring, Harvey worked out that the amount of blood pumped by the heart was so much that it couldn't be used up in the way Galen described. Galen said that the liver produces blood which is used up for the body's food. What my work shows is that the blood is sent round the body by the heart. Furthermore, it is not used up. The same blood circulates round the body again and again. In Harvey's most famous experiment, he proved that blood only travelled round the body in one direction. He showed that if you put your finger above a valve in the vein of the arm and then flatten the vein up to the next valve, the vein cannot fill up again until you take your finger away. Blood can only flow in one direction through the veins. He finally published his work in 1628. Now all his experiments could be copied, any other scientist could check whether he was right. In his book, he pointed out that his work was based not on textbooks, but on dissections. His thinking can still be demonstrated today. This is another description from his work. I took the shell from an egg and placed the egg in warm water. Here I could see a small spot which beat. 
I concluded that this was the beginning of life. Harvey's work made today's medicine possible. Understanding how the blood circulated meant that doctors in the future could develop blood transfusions and major surgical operations. Here are the main points you should have noted down. Vesalius's great book, The Fabric of the Human Body, was published in 1543. It was a complete human anatomy based on dissection dealing with the entire body. As a printed book, it became a standard authority and was soon available in every medical school in Europe. William Harvey became physician to King James I of England in 1618. His book, On the Motion of the Heart and Blood, was published in 1628, demonstrating for the first time that blood circulates round the body. Later in the 17th century, observations with the newly invented microscope confirmed Harvey's theory by enabling the smallest blood vessels to be seen. However, the great discoveries of Renaissance medicine had little effect on how ill people were treated. Even Vesalius and Harvey had little to say about the causes of illness or treatments. Doctors still based treatments on the four humours, Hippocrates and Galen. Apothecaries provided most medicine from their shops. They weren't trained, but some had lots of experience and handed down wisdom. For poorer people, there were quacks, cheap unqualified operators, or local wise women with knowledge of herbs and simple treatments. Now for some exam practice. Look at this print dating from the 18th century, the very end of the Renaissance period. The picture shows a patient being treated by bleeding. Bleeding was a treatment first suggested by Greek doctors. Why was it still being used many centuries later? This type of question carries 10 marks. In the exam, you would need to write a short essay to answer this question. Here are two brief summary answers, one in grade C territory, one more likely to get an A grade. Hippocratic doctors explained illness by saying that human beings were made up of four humours. You were ill when these were out of balance, e.g. had too much blood, so doctors opened a vein or applied leeches to take blood out of the body. No new ideas were thought up to explain illness for hundreds of years. This answer gives the facts all right, but there's no explanation as to why no new ideas were thought of. This candidate would probably be heading for a C grade. Bloodletting was suggested by Hippocratic doctors in Greek times. It is based on the theory of the four humours. Imbalance in the humours, in this case too much blood, is dealt with by bloodletting. Romans took over these ideas as they mainly used Greek doctors. When the Roman Empire fell, the church kept alive what they could of Roman medicine, but did not encourage new ideas. So the approach to curing illness by dealing with imbalance in the humours remained. This answer not only explains the theory of humours, but also places it in its historical context. It gives explanations of why bloodletting was accepted first by the Romans and then by medieval doctors. This answer would be heading for an A. That's the end of the section on Renaissance medicine. Up to 200 years ago, change in medical knowledge and practice had mostly been extremely slow. In the 19th century, however, things began to change very fast. At the beginning of the century, understanding of disease was still very basic. In fact, some still believed in the four humours. But by the 1850s, the Industrial Revolution had brought enormous wealth to many European countries. Industrialization helped bring greater confidence in scientific and medical progress. Across Europe, advances were being made in the study of disease, including the revolutionary new idea that disease was associated with tiny organisms or microbes. A key figure in this discovery in the 1850s was the French scientist Louis Pasteur. While you watch the next clip, think hard about Pasteur's method of working. How would you describe it? A local brewer was having problems. 
the fermentation which was supposed to be going on inside the vats wasn't working. So the alcohol wasn't forming properly. He had asked for Pasteur's help. Please. After a careful series of experiments, Pasteur found the explanation. It's harmful microorganisms in the vats which are causing all the trouble. Leave the matter with me. I'm sure a solution can be found. Oh, thank you, monsieur. But there were wider implications. Everything indicates that contagious diseases owe their existence to similar causes. And Pasteur's work would not only shed light on disease, but would contribute to the debate about what was known as the theory of spontaneous generation. Suppose I boil liquid and leave it to cool. After a few days, moldiness, little animals will develop in the liquid. By boiling, I destroy any germs, but the liquid being again in contact with the air will change, become moldy. Now, suppose that before boiling the liquid, I draw the neck of the flask into a point leaving its end open. Then I boil the liquid in the flask and leave it to cool. The liquid will remain pure, not only for two days, a month, a year, but two or three years. What difference is there then between these two flasks? In the first, the dust suspended in the air and their germs can fall into the flask and arrive in contact with the fluid. In the second, the dust falls on its curved neck or into the first curve only. The one thing that cannot enter easily is the dust suspended in the air. The proof of this is that if I shake the flask violently two or three times, in a few days, it will contain little animals or moldiness. Why? Because air has come in violently enough to carry the dust with it. And never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow of this simple experiment. Pasteur set himself a problem, conducted experiments to find a solution, evolved a theory to explain what was happening, and finally conducted tests to prove or disprove the theory. This is known as the scientific method. Pasteur didn't apply his theory of microbes to human disease, but a German physician called Robert Koch did. During the 1860s, Koch identified the germs for two of the most lethal diseases of the time, TB and cholera. Koch had set up a laboratory in his home, at his and his family's own expense. In this remote country area, there was an outbreak of anthrax, a disease which decimated sheep and cattle and occasionally infected humans. Koch, who had developed a special interest in microscopes, decided to investigate. His research built on the work of Pasteur and Lister on microorganisms. One feature of anthrax was that cattle could catch it not only from other infected cattle, but also from the soil where the infected animals had grazed. Koch showed that this was because the type of microorganisms or bacteria responsible for the disease could exist in the soil as particularly hardy forms known as spores. When these spores are once formed in the soil, there is good reason to believe that anthrax can remain in this region for many years. Knowing this, we must now seek measures in order to save the animals and to protect thousands of people from an agonizing death. Then Pasteur, building in turn on the work of Koch, discovered a method of immunizing cattle against anthrax. He used the technique of vaccination. Vaccination had been discovered by the Englishman Edward Jenner. 
who protected people against the deadly smallpox by infecting them with the closely related but harmless cowpox infection. But Jenner didn't know how it worked. Because of his work on microbes, Pasteur could show how it worked. His first successful mass inoculation against anthrax was carried out in 1881. Other researchers built on these discoveries. Emil Baring found that animals made antitoxins in their blood to fight harmful bacteria and used animal blood containing these antitoxins to cure diphtheria in humans. And Paul Ehrlich developed a way of using chemical dyes to attack specific disease-causing bacteria without harming the rest of the body, a magic bullet that would only kill its target. These scientists were not only making discoveries, but providing cures too. This is one kind of question you'll be faced with in the exams. It's worth 12 marks. What factors were important in enabling these revolutionary medical discoveries to be made? Stop the tape now and have a go at answering the question. Rewind and watch this section again if you need to. In order to answer a question on these discoveries, you need to not just describe the discoveries themselves, but also the different factors that made them possible. Hopefully you will have spotted some or all of the points below. Obviously individuals were important. Pasteur, Koch, Bering and Ehrlich were brilliant original thinkers who built on each other's work. The scientific method of conducting experiments, recording and then publishing work meant that other people could check their results and take it a step further. The fact that scientists published their work and that communications were vastly improved was important in spreading new scientific ideas. Technological developments such as the microscope allowed scientists to investigate microorganisms. Industry and government were important. It was a brewing firm that commissioned Pasteur's original investigations and much of this time-consuming research was funded by governments. All these factors continued into the 20th century. That's the end of the section on the 19th century medical revolution. Now we move on to the drugs revolution from 1900 to 1950. The early 20th century was a time of revolutionary new developments in the use of drugs to fight disease. Drugs which could destroy certain germs without harming anything else in the body. In 1910, the German scientist Paul Ehrlich developed an effective treatment for the killer disease syphilis, a drug called Salvison 606. 1932 saw the first breakthrough in the treatment of the dreaded tuberculosis, a chemical antibiotic called sulfonamide. But the most important of all the new drugs was penicillin, discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, who had been interested in fighting infections in war wounds ever since World War I. While you watch the clip, make notes about the factors that made possible the development of penicillin. Disease whose guerrilla warfare against the Red Cross flag has hitherto outgeneraled even the greatest commanders suffers a setback thanks to the new medical drug penicillin. Before antibiotics were available, many infections were lethal. They were feared as cancer and heart disease are today. One day, in the year 1928, he was examining some sepsis germs grown on jelly before sending them to be destroyed. He noticed that one of the dishes had gone mouldy and that round the patch of green mould, the sepsis germs were dying. Some powerful natural antiseptic was obviously exuded from the mould. It was a daily event for Fleming to leave his laboratory down the stairs and come upstairs about 11 o'clock to get a cup of coffee. On this occasion he had a culture plate in his hand and proceeded to show it to all of us. And I think it would be correct to say that nobody took the slightest notice of Fleming's discovery for a very long while. After Fleming's discovery, however, research on penicillin stopped until just before the outbreak of World War II. 
From a Canadian factory comes the story of production of one of the greatest of modern discoveries in medicine, penicillin. Penicillin is mass produced and it is going out in quantity to the fighting front to reduce the danger of infection by germs in wounds. The miracle drug, penicillin, though discovered in the 1930s, wasn't put into production until the British and American armies saw a pressing need for it. Towards the end of the war, medical teams were issued with supplies of the new drug for the D-Day landings. Penicillin saved wounded men who previously would have died from battlefield infections. Gangrene, from which millions have perished in past wars, has been conquered by the miracle of penicillin. Scientists are manufacturing this wonder drug in enormous quantities to meet the demands of the Allied armies on every front. Here are some of the factors you might have listed. Knowledge. Scientists would not have thought of this treatment before they knew about germs and infection, building on the work of Pasteur, Koch and Ehrlich. Medical research was more and more expensive, and funding increasingly came from government, industry or wealthy universities. The Second World War and its thousands of casualties, it was this that stimulated governments into funding the mass production of penicillin. The success of penicillin was the first in a series of new drug discoveries that one by one enabled doctors to prevent or cure some of the most feared diseases. While you watch the next clip, make notes about when and how drugs for TB and polio were discovered. All over Europe, regardless of ideology, more was spent on routine medicine and clinics. But the greatest priority was given to the fight against the handful of diseases that still took a relentless toll. Tuberculosis was the biggest killer by far. TB, consumption, flourished, especially where there was poverty. Patients were of all ages. Doctors sometimes intervened with surgery. One procedure involved removing several ribs to ease the pressure on the damaged lungs. With TB still taking so many lives, scientists raced to find a cure. And in 1954 came the news so many had waited for. A new series of wonder drugs joins the fight on tuberculosis. Two pharmaceutical laboratories simultaneously developed the new synthetic hydrazid as an anti-TB agent. The breakthrough was based on the work pioneered with penicillin. Within five years, the number of TB deaths in the developed world halved. Throughout the West, the disease would almost disappear. Hundreds of thousands more people survived. And as TB was conquered, poliomyelitis replaced it in the public perception as the most feared infectious disease. My name is Virus Poliomyelitis. I consider myself quite an artist, a sort of uh, sculptor. I specialize in grotesques, twisting and deforming human bodies. That's why I'm called the Crippler. You've never seen me, but I'm sure you've seen my shadow. Polio destroyed the nerves. Its victims lost control of their muscles. People thought the virus was passed on through water. In summer, public swimming pools were closed. Charities tried to raise funds for continuing research. Leading national figures helped with publicity. Vice President Nixon cleaned windscreens for a day. Your faith in medical science and the unending fight against the disease have helped bring about the newest miracle, the Salk anti-polio vaccine, which theoretically could lead to 100% protection. And soon the polio effort paid off too. After the first successful test, it was planned to inoculate every child in America.
Now let's look at a typical exam question. How important was war in the development of penicillin? This question carries 12 marks. Here's a tip. This is an example of an iceberg question. It mentions one factor, the tip of the iceberg, in this case, war. But it's really asking you to write about other hidden factors as well, and to weigh up the factors against each other. Here are outlines of two different answers, one of which will be heading for a C grade and one for an A grade. It was the casualties of World War I that made Fleming decide to do research into infection. Luck played a part. It was chance that Fleming noticed the mould killing off the bacteria. It was because of World War II that penicillin was mass produced. This answer focuses mostly on the role of war, although it does explain that other factors may also have been involved. This candidate would probably be heading for a C grade. War was important as a catalyst. The key research was done after World War I ended and before World War II began. The discovery itself was by chance. However, it was only after the war started that mass production of penicillin began. So war was only one factor, important but not crucial. Penicillin would have been developed anyway, just not as quickly. This answer includes the role of war, but then goes on to look at the other factors, the parts of the iceberg which are hidden below the water, and comes to a conclusion about the relative importance of war. An answer like this would probably be heading for an A grade. Notice that it uses exactly the same facts as the grade C answer, but it uses them more effectively to show a grasp of the relationship between historical factors. When you're revising, it's sometimes good to listen to music to help you to relax. But don't listen to something that you like or it'll distract you and you'll end up singing along. That's the end of the section on the drug revolution and also the whole of section one, periods. Now for the second part of Medicine Through Time, three important themes that run through the history of medicine. The first is the story of women and medicine. <coughs> mm, your temperature's up a bit, love. You'll have to stay in bed a while longer. I'll give you a nice cool drink and a couple of paracetamol and if you aren't better soon, I'll call the doctor. Won't stop crying, eh? You buy him a pen of a dill and he'll sleep like an angel. I'll make a simple of powdered agram. Do you give it him in boiled water, three pinches night and morn, and the stomachache will go in three days. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church viewed the idea of women practicing as healers with great suspicion and most universities were closed to women, so only men could train as doctors. The next clip is about a French woman, Jacoba de Felici, who did practice medicine in Paris in the 14th century. In 1322, she was brought to trial for her pains. Jacoba de Felici, you are brought before this court by the Faculty of Medicine in Paris to answer the following charges that you visited many severely ill people in Paris and examined them, and after this examination you said, I will cure you by God's will if you will trust in me. Further, you received money from these patients and continued to treat them even though you have no qualifications from the Medical School of Paris. Monsieur and despite having been previously fined and excommunicated for this offence, you have continued as before. It was the time when it was very hot. I had this terrible sickness in my head and ears. Uh, Jacoba visited me. She took a lot of care and concern over me. And did she treat you in any way? She certainly did. She gave me different coloured potions. I'd had this fever. Terrible it was. And I'd had any number of doctors coming to try and cure me. And then you were visited by Jacoba. Yes. Thank the Lord. The other doctors had given me up for dead. I had been seized by an illness so severe that my own limbs could not support me. I was crippled. 
I tried water treatment at the public baths, and Jacoba visited me both there and in my home. And was treatment prescribed? Indeed. She gave me a purgative and prepared medicinal baths and ointments, just like the other doctors, except this time it worked. Jacoba claims to be an expert in the art of medicine. This cannot be since she is not approved by the faculty and has not studied at the School of Medicine. As to the people she claims to have cured, it is plain that any man could have cured them better than she. Oh, monsieur, is it not true that unlicensed persons are forbidden from practicing the law? Indeed. Now, how much more important is it then that they should be forbidden from practicing medicine? A lawyer's mistake may lose the case. A doctor's mistake may lose a life. But whatever the view of the authorities, most people could not afford to go to qualified practitioners and continued to rely on local healing women. These healers were mostly ordinary village women who knew about the properties of plants and herbs, not just for cooking, but for medicinal purposes too. They would be asked to treat illnesses, although they would sometimes be attacked as witches if they were not successful. Women continued to be excluded from respectable professional medicine right up until the last century, when some pioneering women began to batter at the doors of the male medical establishment. Apart from writing and teaching, few jobs were open to middle-class women. Florence Nightingale had to fight for seven years to become a nurse. But thanks to her, hospitals on the battlefield were revolutionised, and she became the nation's heroine. Great success, 1854. A Whitby doctor, Elizabeth Garrett, had found a legal loophole to study medicine. She qualified and the loophole was shut. In 1869, Elizabeth Blackwell, who had studied medicine in America and Europe, returned to Britain to take up practice as a doctor. In the very same year, this woman renewed the struggle for women to study medicine in Britain. Her name was Sophia Jex Blake. As you watch the next clip, Make a list of factors which help break down barriers to women. Sophia and five other women managed to get into Edinburgh University, but they were kept apart from male students and not allowed to take a degree. Their cause was taken up by one professor in particular, Professor Masson. The separate classes impose great inconveniences on the women and on the professors. And I propose that in future, women desiring to study medicine be admitted to the medical classes on the same terms as the other students. This caused an uproar. I am sure the ladies now attending the university have come with the purest motives. But how will the gentlemen know if a prostitute comes to their classes? Women are sexually, bodily and mentally unfitted for the toil and responsibilities of medical practice. I know of no great discovery, changing science, that owes its existence to a woman. What right then have women to claim mental equality with men? But in 1876, years after she had begun the campaign, Sophia finally triumphed in Britain. The government passed an act enabling medical schools to admit women, and some began to. I believe that if a single woman desires to consult a physician of her own sex, and if one other woman desires to qualify herself to be that physician, no person whatever has the right to interfere with such legitimate desires. Your list of factors may have included the campaigning of individuals, increasing access to education for women, government action and changing social attitudes. Whichever you thought was most important, you should stress the way they interact with each other. For example, individual campaigns brought the issue to public attention. This helped to change social attitudes and in response to this, government passed new laws. That's the end of the section on women and medicine.
Now, another theme, the story of public health in Britain. During the Industrial Revolution, the growth of towns to house the ever-growing number of workers created big new problems of public health. The next clip describes social conditions in British cities in the 1830s. As you watch it, make notes about the public health problems which became part of city life. The first industrial revolution was well underway, with mills and factories powered by steam producing more and more heavy goods and textiles. As well as this, the population had nearly doubled in 30 years. There were not enough homes for the people who crowded into the towns to work in the mills and factories. They were often forced to live in cellars and attics. Worst of all, there was no effective drainage or sewage disposal. Many people had to get their water from pumps that were often a long way from home and only turned on for a few hours a week, while the muck that lay around in the unpaved streets was seldom carted away. It's no wonder that diseases like typhus, tuberculosis, and now cholera was so devastating. You should have made a note of the following. The population doubled in 30 years. The housing shortage led to massive overcrowding. And poor drainage and sewage and lack of clean water meant diseases such as typhus and cholera became rife. To begin with, government didn't think it was up to them to deal with these problems. But during the 1830s and 40s, there were particularly bad outbreaks of cholera and typhus. Parliament began to recognise it had some responsibility for public health. In 1848, the first Public Health Act was passed. It gave local councils powers to provide clean water and sanitation, if they wished. By 1875, attitudes had changed in favour of government action, and Parliament passed new laws compelling councils to act on clean water, sanitation and slum clearance. Yet even at the turn of the 20th century, there were still very high levels of infant mortality. There was also a new Liberal government, ready to intervene much more directly in the health of the nation. As you watch the next clip, make a plan for an essay in answer to the following question. It's one you could well come up against in the exam. Improving the health of the nation was a bigger problem than just public health. Is this true? And how did the Liberal reforms of 1906 to 1911 begin to tackle the problem? You should plan to write one and a half to two sides on this question, which would be worth about 12 marks. Still living in some condition. The effect of poverty on health was still very obvious. Council records show an increase in death rates amongst very young children. In 1840, 144 out of every 1,000 babies had died. By 1899, it had gone up to 163 babies in 1,000 who died before the age of one. By now, working people were beginning to get organised into groups which demanded changes. The British Empire also needed many more able-bodied people. The government wanted to send fit, healthy men to administer the empire. And the armed forces wanted to see health measures brought in. Because during the Boer War, fought from 1899 to 1902, many recruits had not been fit for service. The massive concern from all sections of society meant that the 1906 Liberal government passed new laws. The kinds of laws that had never been passed before, to give poor people help. 1906, school meals were provided for needy children. 1907, schools had to give medicals to children. All births had to be notified to the health visitor. 1908, old age pensions were paid. 1909, the building of back-to-back -back housing was banned across Britain. When the housebreakers take charge, you can really see how rotten these places are.
At the beginning of the 19th century, there was little government interference in health matters. By the beginning of the 20th, there was a lot. People began to accept that poverty might be the cause of disease. They also began to accept that poor people could not be blamed for poverty. Your essay plan should look something like this. Paragraph 1 explains that poverty was the real problem. Poor health was the result of poor housing, poor diet and poor health care, especially for the most vulnerable, the very young and the very old. Paragraph 2 shows how the liberal reforms began to address these problems. Children needed better nutrition and have their health problems spotted before they became too serious. Free school meals were introduced in 1906 and medical inspections in 1907. Paragraph 3 could cover the banning of back-to-back -back housing in 1909, helping to improve conditions for millions of working-class families. Paragraph 4 could deal with the introduction of old-age pensions, also in 1909, to give people some means of support when they were too old to work. Paragraph 5 could cover the introduction of national insurance in 1911, to help families who would otherwise go hungry because of sickness or unemployment. Finally, in your closing paragraph, you could point out that these reforms were a good beginning but didn't solve the problem. Poverty was still rife. More was needed, particularly to help with the cost of medical care to poor people. So, after the Second World War, the new Labour government put forward a plan for a free national health service as part of an attack on the five problems of want, ignorance, disease, squalor and idleness. It was paid for out of taxes and national insurance contributions, so that everyone could have health care regardless of how much they earned. I've been asked to tell you just a little about this new plan for better health. Our plan is a service which will provide the best medical advice and treatment for everyone, every man, woman and child in this country. For the first time, high-tech surgery and expensive drugs were freely available to poor patients. They didn't have to rely on charity, as many had in the old hospitals. The evil of disease must be overthrown. The voluntary hospital and the expensive nursing home are not enough to maintain this nation in good health. The finest surgery must be for all. Disease is too deep-rooted for the hurried diagnosis of the ordinary doctor with his few stock medicines. State funds must subsidize research on an adequate scale. The completely free service didn't last. By 1952, just four years later, prescription charges were introduced as the costs of maintaining the service became larger than the government was willing to pay. ...to a shilling per item, but the doctor gets no more. Costs are rising for all of us, for the healthy, for the sick, for the chemist, for the doctor. But the National Health Service still continued to have the belief that ordinary people should have access to the very latest techniques That's the end of the section on public health in Britain. Now for the last of our themes, the history of surgery. Surgery has existed for thousands of years, but in the past it was usually only used in emergencies. Generally, surgeons only carried out certain types of operations, most of which had been on the surface of the body cutting off diseased parts of the body and drilling holes in the skull to relieve pressure. Bleeding was the most common surgical procedure. Some people liked to be bled regularly because they thought it was good for them. But almost any other surgical procedure was likely to end in death. So doctors avoided surgery. Generally, they tried to treat the whole body by prescribing medicines diet and exercise to get it back into balance. They did this because they thought disease was part of the whole way you lived your life. What you ate, where you lived, what work you did and what kind of person you were. This kind of medicine continued right up until the 19th century. But by 1840, this way of thinking about illness became less important. Surgery began to take over. It was seen as the best answer for many medical problems. The surgical point of view 
was that illness was not about the whole body, it was just about specific bits. If you had a lump or a growth, it was because there was something wrong with that particular part. The way to treat it was to remove it. You didn't need to look at the whole person, you just needed to remove the problem. In the 19th century, the sources show us that people were beginning to choose surgery rather than drugs or herbal medicines. Surgical techniques were still very primitive in the early 1800s, but over the next 100 years they improved very rapidly. The first breakthrough was in anaesthesia. The use first of laughing gas to reduce pain, and then in the 1840s that of ether or chloroform to make the patient unconscious. Then in the 1860s, antiseptics were developed by Joseph Lister, greatly reducing the risk of infection during surgery. While you watch the next clip, make a list of the advances that made such rapid progress in surgery possible. When it had been shown by the researchers of Monsieur Pasteur that the poisonous property of the air depended on minute organisms suspended in it, it occurred to me that the infection of the wounds might be avoided by applying as a dressing something capable of killing these floating particles. That was Joseph Lister, an English surgeon, writing in 1867. For years he had been worried about the high death rate of patients whose wounds turned septic after operations. So when a colleague, a professor of chemistry, told him about Pasteur's work, he seized on the idea that microorganisms might carry infection. Fill the reservoir with carbolic acid, please, Mr. Leeson. If he could kill them, he might prevent wounds from becoming infected. He knew carbolic acid had recently been used to make sewage safe as a fertilizer. Did it work by killing microorganisms? And if so, would it work for patients? From 1865, he experimented in different ways, including inventing a carbolic spray. Turn on the spraying mechanism, please, Mr. Leeson. The whole scene of the operation or dressing was enveloped in this spray. It went into every nook and cranny of the wound. Our faces and coat sleeves often dripped with it. Needless to say, the carbolic acid made sad work of our hands, which were always rough and cracked. Carbolic acid had its dangers, but Lister was on the right lines. In a few years, the death rate from operations had gone down spectacularly. The Industrial Revolution also meant better instruments and new ways of working for the surgeons. For thousands of years, surgical instruments had stayed the same. The kind of instruments used by the ancient Romans would be recognised by any surgeon even today. But in the 19th and 20th centuries, surgeons created many new devices that helped them to carry out very dramatic new operations. 1816 the stethoscope. 1870, the steam carbolic spray. 1895, x-rays. They could now begin to go deep into the body, developing anaesthetics to lessen the pain of operations, antiseptics to keep the wounds clean, and methods of preventing blood loss to stop the body going into shock. War was another important factor in the advance of surgical techniques. World War II, with its mass production of casualties, stimulated the development of blood transfusions and plastic surgery, as well as penicillin. After the war, the surgical revolution speeded up yet again. In the 1950s and 60s, vast amounts of money were spent to allow surgeons to pioneer dramatic new operations, such as ways of operating on the heart. The development of the heart-lung machine was a major step forward. Now surgeons could operate on the heart for much longer, for hours if necessary. Just behind, enabling the patient to be kept perfectly asleep. This made it possible for the first heart transplant to take place in 1967. Working, it's just being warmed up now, being filled. 
whereas the pump and the various other parts of it which you'll see is going to be filled, of course, with blood from blood donors that some have been put in already. By now, it felt like surgeons could do anything. Surgery was now seen as one of the most important parts of medicine, instead of the poor relation it had been for most of history. When you come to do Eurovision, remember you've got to look not just for the details, what Galen did, what Harvey did, but for the big picture. Yes, you need to know what's important about the Salias, what's important about Harvey, Lister, the rest of those fantastic discoveries at the end of the 19th century. But what's the big pattern? What is the flow of events? How did Vesalius and Harvey change things? And why, at the end of the 19th century, were there such big changes? Not just what each individual person did, but how it all adds up together to a pattern over those years. That's the end of the first part of the program on medicine through time. Don't forget, you can find more information on medicine through time in the GCSE Bite Size Books and on the website at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash revision. The second part of this program focuses on the American West module of the GCSE History Syllabus. The American West is a study in depth. This is very different from a development study like the history of medicine. In this kind of study, you only cover a short period, in this case 55 years from 1840 to 1895.